you saw the numbers, uh, two and a half gigawatt now deployed. And um, last year we were the eighth largest solar market in the world. And I remember three years ago where we didn't even appear on the graph. You know, we were nowhere. And 20 years ago we were definitely nowhere, but we were dabbling. As mentioned, we have two forms of subsidy, a feed-in tariff and a renewable obligation certificate. Um, I'll come on to that, but there's also some other things that also help solar to move on as well, so we'll touch on those as well. The interesting thing is that uh, last Christmas the Renewable Roadmap came out, a revised Renewable <coughs> Roadmap, which included solar for the first time, because a year before they hadn't even believed solar would work, so sudden step change. And um, now there's a solar strategy document coming out as to how we're going to get to the sorts of numbers we're talking about by 2020. Somewhere around about 20 gigawatt is what I believe will happen. Some talk about 22, well we've already done two, so you had 22 and you've got the 22. So, um, but touching on the feed-in tariff, we've been through a roller coaster ride, you know, we started off at 43.3p and the whole world appeared in the, in the UK. And uh, it was rather on the high side, I must admit, and it was impossible to stop it quickly. And the government tried to stop it quickly and got taken to court and lost, and that's history. But even if you look at the tariffs that we have today, and the change again on the end of this month, right, but you only change a very small amount from this point on. The tariffs we have today actually produce the same returns as what we had when we set the tariffs originally at 43.3. So that shows how much pricing has come down since... Uh, 2010. But you can see there's certain tariffs change in, uh, in July and this is part of the digression formula. If you, if you get to certain levels of deployment that triggers a digression. If you don't get there then there is no digression. So you have this sort of system now. Um, and this is the system that basically every three months they'll review what has been deployed so if you add up the, the three lines or three numbers on the top line, if there's 200 megawatt overall deployed, there will be no digression, right? If you go to the next line, if it's 400 megawatt deployed in those sectors, there's 3.5% digression. So now that we're, the tariffs are lower, the, the impact of 3.5% is fairly small. It shouldn't cause any more gold rushes. People used to talk about this because um, when you look at 0.5, if there was uh, 700 um, megawatt uh, installed, and this is only on feed-in tariff, it would tri trigger a 28% digression. Well, we'll never get there. It'll never be like that. You know, that's, that's the equivalent of, what, 2.8 gigawatt per year in the 50 kilowatt type arena. So we're not going to worry about that. In terms of how to work things out, and so you know beforehand what the, what the digression is going to be, they look at the previous month's, um, installs, look at those numbers, and then announce at that point what that digression is going to be, if it's zero, if it's three and a half percent, if it's only one particular band that's affected, or whatever. So you, you have at least three months notice of any change in the, <clears throat> any change in the tariff. And then every three months you go through the same cycle, etc. In terms of rocks, um, one thing to point out, because a rock is worth something in the order of about 4.2p. Some would say it's 4.5, but you've got to take certain things off, etc., etc. Um, so you're talking about 4.2p for a rock per kilowatt hour, and then you have a factor how many times you multiply it by. So at the moment, for ground mounted, it's 1.6 rocks, so it's 1.6 times 4.2, and for buildings, it's 1.7. And you can see again, all of those are set out until 2017. So in effect, we know exactly what the pricing is going to be for that, that period of time. So therefore, you can set the longer term plans around those sort of numbers. Just to point out things relating to planning permission, ground mounted projects do require planning permission, right? And that's uh, more than roughly a kilowatt or something. Um, building mounted projects up to 50 kilowatts, um, you don't need planning permission, they're deemed. But over 50 kilowatts, we've recently found, there's a new thing required, a certification, a certificate of lawful development. Uh, the planner will say it's, it's permissible, right? In theory, it's supposed to be deemed in any case, but there's a, a bit of paper to obtain. 
In terms of the value of electricity, if you're selling electricity to the grid and you're selling large quantities of electricity, you'll get something in the order of 5.8p, depending on who you're selling it to, which utility, etc., green ones or whatever. Um, if you're selling direct to the customers, though, if you're building a solar field alongside someone's factory or whatever, you may get a commercial rate somewhere between 7 and 9p, could even be higher. Electricity pricing in the UK, I would say, is going up faster than normal, right, in terms of the fact you heard that we've got a shortage of energy uh, coming on in, in the future because of the fact that the old power stations are reaching the end of their life, etc. So expect those figures to go up, so it's worth looking at those when negotiating. Just quickly on the trade wars and was mentioned, um, UK government's view is it's a free market and therefore um, they voted no against important duties on Chinese. Um, it's the general belief is the market, the commercial side of the market will sort itself out, that if somebody was selling at too low a price, they'd go out of business and therefore they wouldn't be there. Um, I know there's, this is difficult with some of the so-called subsidies that some of the countries are providing. To date, though, in the UK, something like 80% of the solar deployed is Chinese product, right? Like David was saying, we don't really have much of an industry there. Sharp were manufacturing for Europe, and that is reducing day by day. And there's all sorts of rumours about Sharp uh, leaving the industry or whatever. What we hope is that EU will sort itself out with the Chinese, and they've got this two-month window to sort it out, negotiate, whatever, and come out with something which is sensible, which allows the industry to continue. If it, if it doesn't go like that, we could end up with the industry stalling until the end of the year, and then by then they might have sorted themselves out. What I would say is, you know, I've been involved in this for so long, and, you know, I remember when we had payback periods of 100 and odd years, you know, and we're saying it had a 25-year warranty, you know, this sort of thing. Um, when we approached all the different governments of the world, and there wasn't any one government that could create a market big enough for solar to drive down the price, it was basically wanted lots of governments to, to buy into this. And in doing so, what we were really saying at the time was, look, we need to create a market, we need some subsidies to create the market. If you create that market, we'll reinvest that money and make the scale bigger. And once you get the large scale, then it'll be the equivalent of fossil fuel. And I think some people forgot that over the last few years, that there were some large returns to be made. And rather than reinvesting that into the future, we're putting the money into their pocket. You know, the, the target is, once we get to the so-called grid parity, we're laughing and it's getting there as quickly as possible, was the challenge. So I think people must remember that. That's where we came from. That's what we promised all these governments around the world when we approached them on day one. In terms of uh, the UK, um, and going back to feed-in tariff up to 50 kilowatts type um, uh, in particular, um, there was an impact assessment done, i.e. a report done for government when they set the revised tariffs previously. And at the time, it took some numbers out of the market that people were charging and used that as the basis. Well, of course, the industry was moving so quick. By the time they produced the numbers, got it into a report, gave it the deck, made it into a tariff, the market had moved on already sort of thing. So um, the figures on the left there are the, the rates, or the, the prices per kilowatt for each of those different sectors. And you'll see they were quite high. You know, that's uh, the top ones, equivalent of £10,000 for a four kilowatt system. And you can buy them now for five, six, seven, depending on what modules you use. Um, so what I've tried to show there is there is a big difference in the price and therefore prices have come down. It is unlikely, therefore, that government will change the feed-in tariff, right? The returns are something 10, 12%, sometimes even more. So if the duties are only a small amount, not excessive amount, then it should still work with those, with those tariffs, right? If it's an excessive amount, we might have a problem. In terms of rocks, the rocks were only set um, uh, late last year, and it's pretty tight, and therefore, um, we'll see what happens, we'll have to review exactly what the numbers come out after the, the, the duties are imposed, see what the numbers are and see how that's going to affect the market. But just to, to show the example, April 2011, that's a typical 4 kilowatt system in the UK and those are all the numbers. And if you look at the November 2012, it basically halved in price, right? 
but the actual, although the tariff re changed, the, the actual returns were the same, roughly 11%. So there's still a market out there, it still works, etc. What I would say, if you look at the top line there, it talks about 3,400 kilowatt hours per year. Uh, that has changed as well, because we never really had evidence in the UK because we had very little deployed solar. And what we've found is that the numbers that were coming out of systems were totally different to what we first thought of. So in the past, we were um, small systems in particular were based on 850 kilowatt hours per kilowatt peak. And of course, it made no reference to where you were in the country. And of course, if you're in the south of England, it's far better than the north of England, etc., or north of Scotland. And so we've now got new numbers which relate to where you are in the country. So it's like postcode numbers. Now, you can still work out the numbers yourself for the bigger projects you always do. But what we've been able to prove by the feed-in tariff is that these numbers are real and therefore the, the funders are starting to believe us where previously some funders were sticking with the 850 kilowatt hours. So the solar strategy uh, moving forward, because of the rapid growth we've had, um, the potential of deploying the 20 gigawatt by 2020, there are a few barriers, a few procedures, a few rules and things like that that need to be addressed. Little hiccups that will come along that need to be solved. So government have decided the best way of doing it is to work in partnership with industry and in doing so, look to identify these obstacles, but also related to the growth path to get to 2020, which will be in the solar strategy, and then see which of these um, obstacles need to be sorted by a certain point in time. Right? Some need legislation, possibly. Some just need change of rules or simple, simple ways forward. Again, MCS was not really set up for the industry that we've now created. It was a little small industry expected. We expected 50, uh, 50 megawatt to be deployed in the first year, 80 megawatt in the second year, and basically we had over a gigawatt produced in that time. So we had a totally different industry to what MCS was set up for. So now it's been sorted out, strengthened, whatever you want to call it. But basically it's there to control quality, both in the terms of the products used, but also in the installations. And we have had a few cowboys in the, in the UK and we'd like to get them out of the industry. Reports are also uh, being produced at the moment and looking at the economic impact of various different scenarios of what might happen in the future. And in particular, in terms of duties to see, you know, what level of duty, what would be the impact, what might have to be changed or whatever. And whether there be, I can't say there being adjustments in the, the fit rates or in maybe the rock rate even, it may be there's other ways of handling this. Some of the other rules which apply to it could be relaxed. That's a way forward. We're broken the uh, solar strategy, identify the four sort of groups that need to be looked at and taking appropriate people from industry to work in each of these groups and looking at the sort of grid. You've heard that David mentioned there are reports that say the grid can't handle a certain amount of electricity from solar. My belief is it will be sorted, it can be sorted. It's just as a lot of people don't understand solar in terms of how they judge it in terms of connection to the grid. Um, but there are things coming along which will uh, solve some of these issues and that will be looked at by the grid group. The land use side, what I would say there is that again we don't want to fall into an area whereby we start using the wrong land for solar and get some bad news stories like David mentioned on wind. Uh, so there's a group looking at that and also engaging with the public, making certain they understand the truth about solar as again some of the myths that tend to get written in papers at times. The bankability side, the funders, etc. You know, two years ago, if you went to a funder in the UK, he didn't know what a solar panel was, never mind what the returns would be or whatever. So they've come into the market, but there's still some areas where they're in, in doubt, they haven't got clarity, etc. And that still needs to be addressed, and we need to hold our hands through this sort of thing. And also looking at understand the full cost drivers of, of systems, etc., and what the long term benefits are, and putting it all down in a way whereby the funding and institutions can understand it properly. Community engagement. Um, again, I think that, um, you know, we want to model this on what's happened in Germany in terms of the communities that got involved in solar. In the UK, communities from the um, from the reports that are being produced, they like solar, 
but they don't know how to get involved in it. We haven't sort of taken them down that path. You know, Germany's been in Seoul a lot longer and was able to develop that over a period of time. We're trying to do some catch-up exercises. So it's looking at things like that and trying to get more community participation and possibly local investment in community-type projects. National Solar Centre. Um, I wish we'd had this two years ago because everybody used to ring up to say, I'm now coming into solar because I've heard about these wonderful feed-in tariffs, but where on earth do I go to get the information? How do I know it works? Who are the best suppliers? This, that and the other. All the rest of the, the questions were coming along. And there was no real independent place to go to. So lots of people, unfortunately, you listen to one story from one person, different story from another. Sometimes they got the right story, other times they got the wrong story. Those that got the wrong story made some mistakes which cost them financially, and that was not good for the industry. So now we've got this solar centre up and running, and that's its purpose. It's an independent facility using evidence-based information, right? Having the technical knowledge, all the facts at its fingertips. This business of how many gigawatts is installed or how many megawatts is installed in the UK, you know, we've been picking numbers out of the air trying to get to it. You know, there was no way of recording it, the way things had been set up, because we never expected an industry to suddenly go to two and a half gigawatt. By now, according to the original FIT rules, we should have been at about 200 megawatts, something like that, and we're at a totally different level. So what we're trying to do is work across all the sectors, um, engage with university academia. Again, training, most of the training that's been done in the UK relates to how do I put a two kilowatt system onto a house roof, and that's it. And once I've done that, I'll do a 50 kilowatt onto a barn. I can do a five megawatt into a field, you know. This, there is no training, no training mechanism beyond that initial training. So again, trying to put those sort of things right. Um, Planning and building regs, there's lots of things coming along in terms of planning and building regs which will affect the market in the future and it'll be driven whereby solar has got to be part of building's end of story. Should they, should they really get a subsidy when you've got to do it? All those sort of questions. They do at the moment and they probably will continue to do so. In terms of grid and the grid operation and storage and things like this and is the grid weak, is it strong, can it take the load? Is the load on July the 1st going to be such that it'll cause the grid to go down on that one day and things like this? All these sort of stories and myths have got to be solved and got to be worked out. And there are ways of overcoming a lot of these issues. It's just no one sat around the table to solve it. So that's another one of the purposes. Um, and like I mentioned, the installation numbers, it's, uh, it's been a pain trying to guess what they are. So the National Solar Centre is funded by um, ERDF Grant, European Regional Development Fund, and it's based in Council, in Cornwall, sorry. And uh, the reason it's in Cornwall is that's where the ERDF Grant was available, so that's why we're put there. But Cornwall is also one of the counties that has probably more solar than anybody else, because on the original map it showed the best place to put solar was in Cornwall, because that was coloured in red, so everybody went there. Um, the BRE, uh, a building research establishment, um, they are actually running the, the centre, but also putting investment into it at the same time to, to try to help the industry move forward at a rapid rate. Uh, there have been contributions by a number of founding partners, and if anybody else wants to be a partner, by all means, see me with a chequebook, whatever you'd like to give. Um, but you can see people, the, the, the reason they got involved as founding partners was they believed in the industry, they wanted to help move it forward. They didn't want anything special on behalf of themselves. They just want to make certain that there was an industry in the future of a quality, et cetera, that would fit with their, their philosophies. So the building is based in uh, St. Austell in Cornwall, which is in southwest England. And um, one of the first things we produced, because there have, has been the start of some minor sort of rumblings in the press, was to produce some sort of practice guide, good practice guide for... Um, planning permissions, right? Planning of solar. In terms of whether it's on buildings or whether it's in fields, and fields in particular has been a, an issue just recently. So that document has been produced. It, it basically gives you guidance as to what is likely to be accepted by planners, and also it's guidance for the planners as to what you should be looking for at the same time. But likewise, that you can make cases for other things that might not fit the initial criteria, 
but there might be reasons why that particular piece of land is appropriate, etc. So again, it tries to help to steer people down those paths. Um, you can download it. All, all documents that come out of the National Solar Centre of this nature will be for free, so you can download it on that website. Please don't try and download it today because it's getting loaded at the moment, so it's probably tomorrow or a couple of days' time. Other guidance documents that we're putting out are really the grid connections, um, you know, trying to, trying to simplify the understanding of what you can and what you can't do and what the ways around things, etc. are. Um, again, some sort of uh, guidance for funders so they really understand the full story behind solar and really take into account uh, the right facts is against some of the myths that float around. Um, developers, development, etc. Trying to produce something that gives a guide to them as to what you know what really happens, what complies with rules and regulations in the UK, etc. Also coming into BIPV, we see BIPV as a potential quite large market in the UK because of the way the building regulations are going. And again, it's trying to sow the seed about what is the best ways of doing things, what is the way you should think about, what other ways you maybe want to develop a new product or whatever it might be that would suit UK conditions, etc. And again, trying to tackle design and making certain that people understand design because we've got some silly systems out there that don't quite work properly and it's just fundamental things like they haven't been designed correctly, the modules have not been matched to the inverters, etc. The other thing that's underway is um, uh, we've had no code of practice. We've got the MCS uh, design guide, which covers up to 50 kilowatts, but anything above 50 kilowatts, it's like anything goes, right? And okay, there's certain regulations that you come across at times, but what we're trying to do now is produce a, a, a code of practice, a basic code of practice for solar that covers everything up to a 50 megawatt field. The other thing that will be happening at the NSC is there'll be a test site, and it doesn't mean testing modules uh, in the normal way you would in a laboratory or whatever, but more to do with testing them in UK weather conditions, comparing different modules in side-by-side -side testing. There's been lots of people who have come along, and some were right and some were wrong, saying that their product was better than other products, their product worked better in the light conditions, etc., etc. The idea of this is it will be, the products will be put there, completely monitored, reports produced every year, and therefore, if, if what the manufacturer believes is correct, it will show that, and that will relate to UK weather conditions, etc. So that's the intent of that, and we've got a big site down in Cornwall in which to play around and do that. We're also looking at um, some system testing as well, and the business of, you know, the, the impact of different module arrangements with different inverters and things like this, and also the impact of connecting them to the grid. And also the big thing, as David mentioned, is storage is just around the corner, and we want to make certain that one of two things. One is storage for the domestic or the building side of the market, but also storage for the distribution network as well, where there is a, where there is a weak grid, can it be strengthened by putting a bit of storage in, allowing that um, so that to be connected. Some of the things that go on about that side uh, uh, you know, really need to be solved. Um, the other things that will be happening are design courses. Like I say, there's, there's lots of people that, from the UK side in particular, just suddenly sprung up into the industry and had been on no design course ever. All they do is ring up the distributor and say, I want a three kilowatt system, and whatever he gives them, that's it, right? And we've heard of people that were putting in 15 kilowatt systems and just ordering five three kilowatt systems because that's all they knew how to fit. You know, so that's that's not the way forward sort of thing. Other things will be product development at BIPV, which I've mentioned, and also a bit of due diligence as well because again, if we're going to advise the funders with regard to what they should be looking at, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and understanding so that we may as well look at the other side of it at the same time and give them due diligence uh, reports. I mentioned the uh, building codes are changing and we're heading for what's called zero carbon buildings uh, by around 2017, houses a bit before that, uh, buildings a little bit after that sort of thing. But the market started in any case and the starts of uh, tile systems on roofs etc over the last period of time, facades, louver systems, all sorts of things that architects like to design in, they don't like to design standard solar panels 
that don't really match with the elegance of their buildings. So they're looking for products which are appropriate to their building design. So again, this is where the, the home market will grow because you won't be shipping a lot of these products from miles away, you'll be actually making them local to the market. Some of the markets um, for some of the tiles are appropriate to certain other markets, but generally you find on the tiles that each country, even in Europe, has got a different tile requirement in order to match with their roof construction. So there's a few things there to learn in terms of where we're going in the future. Quick mention of other things. Um, the Green Deal, and there is a little bit of a formula there that can be used to help uh, solar PV at the same time, so it tends to relate to the smaller end of the market. Um, again, the mention of the Renewable Heat Incentive, it's going to be announced in the autumn. Um, it's way behind where it should have been coming out. It should have been coming out roughly at the time of the feed-in tariff for PV. Um, the funding will commence in the spring of 2014. The general view is, from the numbers we've seen, the returns are going to be something similar to, to uh, solar PV, and therefore it should increase the market. We've had a market which has been, on average, it goes up and down a little bit, but on average something like 50,000 um, installs per year, and that's probably going to go up to something like a quarter of a million, or maybe it's even higher. The problem is, have we used up all the roof space by putting PV on, and there's no roof space to put the solar thermal, but uh, I'm sure we'll find ways. In terms of the markets, markets like everywhere else, basically as a domestic market, dead easy. Social housing, a little bit tweaking needed of the fit rules, because at the moment um, you get a restriction on uh, the feed-in tariff based on social housing. You only get 90% of the tariff. And the problem is it was never really taken into account that the developer, or the social housing landlord, etc., has to give that customer that electricity for free, so it can't really take the value of that. So this case has been put to deck at the moment to show that 90% rule should be scrapped, which is why some of the social housing projects did not happen. A number of the social landlords have met with the minister, and basically, you know, the indication is if you go back to the normal 100% feed-in tariff, the normal feed-in tariff, they will continue on with their projects. The commercial market is a little bit awkward at times because in the UK, lots of people... Uh, you expect them to own their buildings, but they don't. They have them built, they're leased, etc., etc., and the lease rules are crazy at times. You know, a lot of the big supermarkets, for instance, some they own certain of their buildings, and others they lease. Some are built for them, and they lease them, you know, to a specific design. But when you look at the lease arrangements, the lease arrangements don't tend to go on for 20 years. The lease arrangements are 10 to 15 years. So if you try to get someone to sign up for a 20-year, when they might not be there for more than 15 years, it becomes a problem. So we need to find the formula to get round that because you know, the department's uh, view is we've got all those roofs, all those acres of roofs, they should all be covered with solar in any case. In terms of the solar farms, yeah, there's plenty going on at the moment. And if you fly into Gatwick, you'll actually see solar at the side of the runway. So it's starting to get out there. Um, what I'd like to say is that we need to keep it a bit of a secret though don't put it in highly visible areas like some of the hillsides I've seen or, you know, alongside a main road whereby, you know, you can see people thinking, hmm, do I really like that? Put it at the other side of a hedge and don't see it. Great. That's ideal. So is the UK a good place to do business? Um, I've mentioned it. Well, you can read these facts, to be honest. Um, what I would say is that um, since we came out with a feed-in tariff, um, there have been a number of companies who have come into the UK and set up businesses. Some disappeared when the feed-in tariff was cut severely, and others stayed on. Those that stayed on are seeing a viable business moving forward. And what I would say is that anybody else that wants to, please come along. If you're good, if you're quality, etc., that's what we want, and therefore come and do it in the UK. We have got some great facilities, we've got some great rules, we've got some great ways of making things happen, we've got politics that... Mm, even no matter which government are in, in, in politics sort of thing, in power, they've all got the same strategy and we've got that little nagging doubt about have we really got energy for the future with some of the power stations being cut off. So we've got a great future for solar and I can't see anything really to stop it. So UK is all about quality, that's what we want, that's what we're um, about now and uh, please come and join us. Thank you.